Hi, my name is Tosif Noor, and I'm a critic, curator, and PhD student in the History of Art program here at UC Berkeley. Juniper, it's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you about your practice. We've worked together on the first year MFA thesis show, um, Optimal Conditions, and it's just been such a pleasure to get to know you and your work and work with you um, and to be in conversation with you today about your new exhibition, uh, Botanical Entanglements. So you work as an artist and an ecologist, and you're traversing these two fields, visual art and science. And I think people often think of these fields not only as just different, but entirely separate. You know, one, uh, you know, science is one realm, art is another realm. Um, but I think what your work does is actually show us how intimately connected these fields are. And the way you do that is actually thinking about these intimate connections or entanglements between us as humans and other living matter, plants, animals, different kinds of species. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to work across these two fields? Yeah, thank you, Telsif. That was that was a really beautiful way to, to put that and bring that together. Um, you know, I've, I've been interested in art and science my whole life. Um, and it's so interesting. I feel like more recently there's been this like excitement around these ideas of art and science kind of coming together. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And the idea that, you know, they, they are actually, um, there are so many overlaps in um, ways that we're thinking about things, you know, in, in similar ways. But I'll say as I've gotten, deeper and deeper in this and really um, had the, just the, the luck to get to go so deep within both fields. Um, I did a PhD in ecology at UC Santa Cruz and, um, you know, really got in, got into the, the, the theory there and the, you know, the conversations that are happening. And then now I'm at Berkeley, um, I was invited to do an, an MFA. And um, I also see just how totally different these like modes of inquiry are too and I think that's really important to recognize is like like we have this shared um, fascination for thinking about and trying to understand our world around us and um, you know uh, make make sense of it all and also like do research right artists are doing incredibly important research that I think the sciences sometimes fail to recognize that arts are that you know so much more than aesthetics right um, or communication of, of science research if you're thinking about art and science collaborative uh, collaboration specifically. But um, yeah, the, the methodological inquiry is so different though, um, the approaches and, you know, and with science, it's like um, when it gets down to it, that, that science hypothesis testing is really like, there is a very specific way and that's kind of the core and backbone of a lot of, um, of the whole science process, but like the creative inquiry part, which is I think what you're kind of hinting at um, is really like there's, there's this shared exploration, you know, and where those like aha moments come from. And, um, the, and I think right now there's this great space for like um, really exploring the inner spaces between things and synergies and um, you know, the exciting thing about arts is that um, you've got, it's just so wide open with uh, your approach to research that I'm really excited about. But, you know, also within that, like I, I thought, um, I thought the arts are just this like free, it's freedom, it's this free place, but it's not. I mean, it's absolutely governed by, um, you know, if you want to be, if you, if you want your work to be considered and respected now and you want to be able to exhibit like like people want you to be talking about what's what's the important conversations and framing it kind of around that. And like, it's exciting to push back at the edges or think about new ways to do it. But I also see that, yeah, there are definite expectations for like how one should be approaching it um, within the art disciplines and without going too deep into that, which could segue into a whole other discussion. Um, but I just wanted to say that, yeah, so I, so I did um, I guess to just kind of like give you a, a quick glossing over from the beginning. I came from Joshua Tree area. So I'm a desert, um, desert person and um, down in the Mojave. And I grew up, you know, first generation college student, low income community. And um, I had an interest in the natural world. My father was a landscaper. Um, 
my parents both ran, ran that company. And um, I, was, I was drawn to plants from a very young age and I was really lucky. There's a incredible riparian forest in the desert there with all of these medicinal plants. And um, I met an ethnobotanist um, who, who knew a lot about um, the, the histories of the plants in the area and um, you know and indigenous uses of the plants. And it was just so fascinating and um, deeply moving to me that that started my path as a, as a biologist. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I'm an artist. I've been making art and drawn to art my entire life. And um, as I was going through school and kind of pursuing, you know, always, always uh, making art and finding that I, you know, I had to make art because I'm, I'm fundamentally um, an art driven, a visual artist. I'm also a musician um, and a dancer. I've been doing it all. Um, but I, um, you know, as it came time to, I went to community college, um, and as it came time to, to start at a university, I was accepted to Berkeley, and there was just no way that it would have been okay for me to study art, um, you know, the conceptualizing of, like, what does one do as an artist, and especially as a first generation college student, it was just like terrifying for my family to think, you know, that I've worked that hard to then like, you know, our, our ideas and understanding of what people can do with an arts degree was very limited um, in my community. So I kind of went with my second love, um, which was thinking about plants through a plant biology lens. Um, and, you know, I had a great time at Berkeley doing that. And um, then, you know, did a lot of research in Central America. Um, I left the academy to affect real change. I wanted, to, I thought, as a, as a public school teacher in Oakland, and I taught science, and that was like powerfully moving experience. Hardest work ever. Um, teachers are are incredible public school teachers. Um, and uh, and then I, I so I did a lot of international research um, back and forth. I had an arts career. Um, lived in Buenos Aires, painting for a number. For years and then um, came back to do a PhD at UC Santa Cruz in ecology. Couldn't stop the art and was lucky enough to have a committee that let me do some of my work as in my dissertation as an artist. And I found um, Don Haraway's work, which was really uh, important to me, and Anna Singh at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And TJ Demis is another really amazing thinker, and Karen Parraj. I mean, there's just a host of people. Um, Kim Talbert was there for a bit. And um, yeah, I, I was really excited and inspired by what's happening in like this growing space of kind of conversations in environmental humanities um, and, you know, different fields there, but that really inspired me to keep growing and developing as an artist um, and thinking about just more interested in thinking about asking questions about plants in the natural world through um, artistic and kind of environmental humanities types of lenses. Um, now here I am uh, with the, the luck of being at Berkeley. I'm kind of just getting to focus solely on an arts practice right now. Um, that is, thank you so much <laughs> for taking us through that. I mean, what really came out for me in tracing that trajectory is that you're bringing your life experiences to the study of different forms of life, right? Like, I think you're really thinking holistically um, about the environmental humanities as a practice for the now and the future, but it's all informed by these different experiences that you've had. And I think that um, in terms of synthesizing the different elements that you've learned from being, uh, you know, from, from growing up in the desert, from working at Berkeley to working as a school teacher, all these different experiences have really um, come through in your work. And I think it makes so much sense to me thinking about the way that your work here um, really thinks about these histories. So let's just dive in to your installation, Botanical Entanglements, which is installed at the Julia Morgan Hall um, at the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. Um, can you walk us through maybe just the thematics and the different components of the installation and how this collaboration with the Botanical Garden came about? Um, especially, I think what would be nice if, if you could maybe think about how you had to respond to both the interior architecture of the Julian Morgan Hall. Um, you know, she is a sort of 
landmark architect of this area, but then you're also responding to the plants and the plant life outside in the botanical garden. So it's a multi-part question, but maybe if you could just walk us through um, the installation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, a lot of situatedness there. Um, so I actually, I, I uh, ended up doing this work uh, in response to an artist residency call through Benjamin Blonder's um, uh, Plants e Ecology Lab at UC Berkeley, and they were doing research at the Botanical Gardens. And it was um, a really exciting residency opportunity. Um, and they had like so hundreds, like people were so excited about this. Um, and it just, to me, really screams like, like scientists need to be carving out um, sections of their budget to collaborate like holistically with artists, not just, you know, bring in on the end for science communication purposes, but really like, like have some dialogue happening in their, their labs and just like see what we can do here. Um, but you know, right, you got to pay your artists. Um, so yeah, so uh, they, they had a lot of applicants. They ended up, cho uh, Ben chose two, myself and an incredible composer, Marcus Norris, who's actually going to be performing at the closing event. Um, and uh, he's got, he's got a, a just wonderful approach. Look him up. Um, but um, yeah, so I guess just to get into the installation and the work. Um, so if you if you walk into the space, you'll see, I think one of the first things you would see are these these very large um, silks that take up the room and um, they are these huge hanging silks with prints on them uh, in hot pink magenta. There's a lot of white on the silk, but the print, um, you know, maybe because of the context, you would understand right away that, that those are like leaf vein systems, although they are abstracted on the edges. Um, and, um, and I'll get into a little more that what, what this actually means, but in the, um, the space itself, so these 12 foot silks and there's five of them um, filling the main hall. And then there are um, branches um, formed into tree sculptures, three different tree sculptures that hang in the large bay window. Um, and they are, are woven and created with hanging roots. Um, and the branches are in, con or the trees are in conversation with each other. Um, there are many leaves that I have, um, um, you know, I hung these, these sculptures and then I hand placed every leaf once it was inside of the space itself. Um, the leaves are all from plants. Um, actually, so there's a step away of this, but um, originally it started that the leaves were all um, from plants that I collected in my nearby community in Berkeley um, and then also at the botanical gardens where I've been spending a lot of time over the past 20 years. Um, so I have a close relationship with the place and I specifically chose plants that were medicinal and that had um, a lot of you know, really interesting human um, human uh, stories connected with them. Um, and with those plants, uh, each leaf has a different um, image on it. And those images are um, images of the plant's local environment, whether that be um, local uh, interaction ecologies with other organisms. So, like um, perhaps it's a ray, or it's a it's a crow that that visited and you know frequented that plant um, that I would see, or a pollinator, uh, other plants that grow nearby. Um, perhaps it's uh, images of the built environment, like fencing or a bicycle that's parked there, you know, and bringing these, these histories together to really show all of the different things that impact these local ecologies of the plant and the way the plant grows. I mean, the plant is constantly sensing and responding to its local environment. So any changes in light or soil or nutrient availability are gonna affect the very next leaf that comes out of the plant. It's gonna be responding um, to these different sensory and you know, chemical and physical um, spaces in the environment. And so um, these are, it's basically creating this collective story. And then the, the roots are also interspersed with silk threads that um, forming mycorrhizal fungi, which is another thinking of, of networks of interaction and connectivity. I'm also a mycorrhizal ecologist, so I couldn't not include mycorrhizae in this exhibition. Um, and that leads to my other work, but um, yeah, so there are these mycorrhizal rhizomatic networks. That's another way I think about um, cross community connections. Um, yeah, and these are in conversation with those large silk um, silk hangings, which you know are showing the silk hangings are showing these deep deep evolutionary histories of plant leaves. These networks and like um, you know ways of of uh, transporting information that plants have been evolving for millions of years. Each individual plant. 
Um, and I stained the leaves, um, the veins with cochineal, which is um, a bright red um, insect dye that has these really incredible, fascinating, um, you know, complicated histories um, in colonialism and um, just throughout different cultures. Um, and I wanted to bring in, you know, I wanted to bring in all of these, these different stories into the work and ways of thinking about how we interact with our environment and artistically interact with our environment too. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we move through into the smaller room space, uh, you'll see three more, um, um, three more silk panels uh, that are smaller. They're about five feet, three and a half feet by five feet um, of, of leaves as well. And again, like the other hanging silk leaves, um, the edges are obscured. I, as I blew up these leaves, I just started to think about like, oh, they're so amazing. And I wanted people to get lost in the majesty that is this like form and function of the natural world and how it, you know, can look like circulatory systems and, um, you know, river, like, coursing river ways and um, just all, it can kind of be abstracted in these different forms. But as I was standing there looking at these giant leaves, I also felt like I'm exposing them in a way that felt a little bit intense, you know, and it was making me think about gaze and the science gaze and the way that we look at things and objectify them. And, you know, so much of art too is, are these poetics, right, of gesture and metaphor. And so I wanted to think about that and think about, okay, well, I'd like to return some anonymity back to these leaves. And so I blurred and obscured the edges. So you don't know which species it is. And so with the smaller panels um, in this, in the other room, I blur the edges through embroidery. And so I'm using white thread to blur it into the white background. Um, again, as a gesture of kind of giving some anonymity back to that leaf. And, um, you know, and then I, by doing that, it brings in the histories of embroidery and, you know, who does embroidery and um, stories of kind of women's work and juxtaposing that against science research, which, you know, has its lineages in like Eurocentric white male patriarchy. Um, and uh, so there's an interesting tension, I think, there um, that comes up. And also thinking about, you know, what do we embroider on and what do we give this like intense care to um, with that much stitching and embroidery? And so there's three of those leaf panels. Um, and then you turn to another window and there are all of these leaves um, that have been printed uh, with the images from the local environment, these medicinal leaves, and with part of the leaves decayed. And I decayed them in the laboratory, which is much of the way that the, um, the research lab works um, that I work with. And so it's exposing the, the deep vein histories um, against these localized community um, histories of the individual plant. And then I stain them red so you can see that that um, those vein histories together and they're all woven in this big um, kind of net using silk threads um, that was so delicate and one of the most painful things I ever did was moving that thing and I'm never going to do it again it was horrible oh my gosh I like I, I lost like a year of my life like moving that tapestry so go see it because I, I don't even know what's in and it's um, weighted at the bottom with river rocks to kind of like hold it down. And the river rocks are all from the local Strawberry Canyon River, which also have, you know, they're worn smooth. So they have their, their long stories and histories. So you'll see like the repeated metaphors are really like thinking about these embedded histories across different scales. Um, and then finally, the other little piece sitting in there is, um, you know, I really wanted to think about as we're like looking and gazing upon these, these plant lives and these leaves, you know, I wanted to turn the gaze back onto ourselves and human histories and, you know, situate it, like you're saying, in, in the local space. And so um, the botanical gardens, you know, what were they before they were botanical gardens? And, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, the camera only allows me to go back so far. I mean, I would have loved to have gone back to, uh, you know, the, the first peoples and indigenous stories of, of the way that the land was managed and caretaken what it looked like then, um, but I, but in part of this work, I was using real photos. So, you know, that takes us back to the late 1800s. Um, and that, that archival imagery that I could source was looking at settler colonialism of the um, area that was the botanical gardens um, and um, yeah, some of the farming lands and just the way the rolling meadows were and how different the landscape looked and um, the farm in the area. 
Um, so you'll see you'll see some of those different images rendered very small. Um, I wanted to take these large landscapes and shrink them down onto clear acetate, and I embed them on microscope slides, um, and then invite you to kind of look back through time through this microscopic lens um, and examine some of our our histories there um, of the local garden space and. You know, in that way, also kind of confusing the scales. Like you've got these small leaves rendered very large into what almost become like landscape scale experiences, and then these land, and then these landscape scale spaces that have been like highly modified and fractured by humans, like rendered really small, um, and then also dyed with some of the pink dye that I've got, so it, it keeps that that space. And there's some thread wrapping, and um, you know, to kind of continue these threads. Um, throughout the work. And then uh, more specifically too, to the, the space itself at Julia Morgan Hall. Um, when I was invited to do this work, I came and I, you know, I was imagining different spaces for installing. And when they invited me to, to work with the Julia Morgan Hall, it was just astounding. It's so gorgeous and beautiful and big, you know, like big, big ceilings and so much light. And so I really um, had I changed a lot of the way that the work was going to be coming together and the scale of it and, and just really wanted to work with the light um, and thinking about anyways how plants, I mean, plants are sculpting and working with light like they are, they are the original alchemists. They take sunlight, carbon dioxide and water and bring it together to make form, which makes life possible for all of us. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, think about light as a material and use that with my work as well, kind of in, in conversation with plants in the space. Um, and, and, you know, so every piece in there is thinking about and working with light, natural light, except for the microscope, which is now that I'm, you know, putting words to it, it's interesting how things come out. Um, I'm realizing that's the only um, human, like, added light in the space um, and it's to look back upon human processes which I guess is apropos um, yeah and I think I'm sure I could talk a lot more about it yeah. but that that's what um is no, that's is fantastic right Juniper I mean I think that well thank you so much first of all for taking us through like a really detailed uh journey through this installation because I think what you've allowed us to do is see how both um, expansively, you know, casting a wide net, but also thinking at real detail. So at thinking at really local embedded histories, both in scale, so like the microscopic images, but also um, these larger silk panels and, and really kind of complicating the idea of what it means to observe, what it means to uh, catalog, record, and how can we do that in a way that is um, more in line with the kind of life forms and, and the, the real complexity of life forms that we um, are inhabiting and entangled with. So in, in this way, like, you know, you're taking us through this long history of colonialism and habitation, human settlement, but then, you know, thinking about these individual plants, but treating them almost with the dignity that we should afford people, you know, um, obscuring them, you know, not, not subjecting them to a kind of record keeping and cataloging that um, instrumentalizes them in a way. So I think that's a really generous way of, of, of thinking. And um, I'd love to hear maybe because, you know, you've had such a you've had such a long relationship with this area, um, going to school at Berkeley, teaching at Oakland. How, you know, how has that been um, bringing that into this exhibition, you know, thinking about these local plants and, and their stories? Um, what has your, have you, has doing this project changed your perception of, of this place that you actually know very well? Hmm. Yeah, you have you asked so many good questions there. Um, I'll answer the last one first, and then I might circle back into colonization of the the sure. space, um, and just thinking about sciences in general. Um, 
Yeah. So I came, so I came to Berkeley, you know, originally, as I mentioned, to study plant biology. And it's so funny. I, I, so I studied plant biology and genetics. And the reason I chose that was because I wanted to study botany, but botany was considered a dead science at Berkeley. Like it didn't exist. And so I like, I looked at this schedule, the, ca the catalog, and I was like, well, this word says plant. So I'm going to just like check that box and go there. Um, Unfortunately, got in and yeah, had a really you know interesting experience. So I was trained uh, as an undergraduate in in local plant communities in Berkeley, and I learned a lot about um, the histories and plant community assembly and you know, but from a, a specific framing, right? Like it was, it's this. Um, there's a there's a you know system of culture uh, within disciplines. And so I was studying it with the specific like Linnaean and all of also phylogeny and um, thinking about these systems of classification and the way that we, we look at and think about plants. Um, and, um, and then, you know, after I, and then I worked uh, within communities as an educator for a long time, and I brought all of my love for plants into my classrooms. I taught high school at Oakland High, and like everything was all about the plants um, and trying, you know, working really hard to, to try and inspire students with my passion, but then also to learn um, about what they were interested in with plants and how I could like incorporate that back in um, and we could learn together. And, um, and middle school students as well. Um, and so then coming back, you know, later and doing, and I also worked in a laboratory at Berkeley for a while, working with a, more of a research plant, but coming back um, all these years later and, and being invited to do this work and, you know, um, start this project, I really, I really wanted to approach it not as a scientist. That was important to me, like the framing of coming at this and like, what is my situated, like, what is my stance, right? Um, and I, so I came at this like a community member. That was my idea. Um, I wanted to spend time with plants in my local community. I wanted to talk with people that are walking by who love different plants and trees. Like people in Berkeley are really serious about their plants too, uh, I found. And, you know, I, so I would talk with people and I would see all, like, there's so much wildlife, the deer come through all the time, the turkeys, like that there's a Cooper's hawk that lives right above my house, owls. And, you know, so watching all of these interactions in, in the entangled environment that we have here and how that, you know, could be um, impacting these different plant lives, I thought was so um, exciting and interesting. And so, um, you know, Absolutely, just slowing down and taking time to sit and be with um, the different plants and think about the plant lives, I thought was really um, important mm -hmm. while I was doing this, as opposed to so much of science research sometimes is like, okay, you've like found your question you're going to ask, and now you need to answer it. And that is like, there are steps and it involves a lot of data collection, which looks a very specific way. Um, and that's like putting on a certain hat, you know? And um, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to approach um, this kind of work with, with that framing at all. Um, and so Absolutely. I guess- to, so, I mean, I think that is, you know, that leads really beautifully to what I think is really, um, driving some of this research that's happening at Benjamin Blonder's lab, but also in, in your um, approach as an artist is thinking about what that scientific framing is, but then mm -hmm. applying that kind of humanities decolonial, um, you could say, approach in terms of both um, how we understand what knowledge is, right? You know, so is knowledge always just about recording and cataloging and seeing with this kind of um, uh, identifying or a vision that fixes something? Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to, to sort of see how you've sort of seamlessly, in, and maybe not even seamlessly, but like you're, you're integrating it in an entangled way um, because, decolonization and decolonial thought in the arts and humanities, um, in the museum field where I sort of came from yeah. um, before coming to Berkeley, it's it's an ongoing conversation. Right? Uh -huh. I think decolonization is an ongoing process and that's how we have to think of it. Um, so we might understand that in terms of 
repatriating objects or, 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 or that kind of thing um, in the arts and humanities or changing our syllabi. But in the hard sciences, I think maybe, you know, the hard sciences, whatever that term means, um, that I think maybe people might think of this as a very, you know, a newer, newer approach, or, or maybe it's something that they're not as familiar with. So, um, yeah, I mean, just as you were going to uh, maybe talk about this kind of how the process is happening or how you see it, if there are developments that you're particularly excited about within the field. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that prompt. Um, so, you know, I, when I'm, I guess to think about that from like, this work specifically in the botanical gardens and then connecting it out. You know, you go to the gardens, right? The UC Berkeley Botanical Gardens and you see all of the, I mean, first of all, the gardens are uniquely incredible because it is designed as a research space. And so all of the habitats are actually um, created as research um, type spaces. And, you know, it's an it's an interesting model for um, for a botanical garden, but you know you look at all of the plants gathered here, and um, they're they're so beautiful and wonderful. But it's also important to remember, you know, that botanical gardens have these kind of problematic histories um, in the context of you know colonial violence histories and uh, hegemonic systems of knowledge production and white appropriation. And so, you know, you consider how you know botanical gardens started during the the periods of colonization, and you've got plant speculation. And, you know, plants were scouted, discovered, and taken and collected for people's private collections or sold to gardens. Gardens and um, you know knowledge was taken often uh, without people's permission and um, um, you know plants were used for for big scale production like rubber um, was a big one and then you know you've got the acts of renaming plants within the Linnaean in the Linnaean systems is also a kind of claiming um, Jamaica Kincaid writes really beautifully about um, these ideas of, of naming and what that does for the way we think about things um, so you know right but while there is that framing for botanical gardens to think about, I also um, specifically to this work wanted, without getting like too mucked up in it, I wanted to think about like what was happening right now at the botanical gardens and, um, and then also in sciences and science fields, um, you know, and I look around at the UC Berkeley Botanical Gardens and the people there, they are just so wonderful and they work tirelessly um, at the gardens and it's out of a true love to care for plants, right? And they, they really, um, and they wanna inspire acts of stewardship in the natural world with others. Um, and so, you know, like what's happening now are these, these really like uh, these acts of care and education and, and looking back to um, indigenous um, knowledge, um, knowledge of, of plants and communities too is really a conversation that's happening all over um, both, you know, in educational, more like community educational spaces, but um, in science education as well. Um, so like the science research group I'm working with, you know, um, if I wanted to approach this work and kind of critique it, which I do a little bit, um, you know, the complicated legacies of knowledge production and um, reductionism of living beings that, that is very much a part of science, um, you know, and it's science came from the Eurocentric white male approach to considering, examining, and, you know, looking at the other, um, you know, but, but I wanted to think about what's happening right now, too, and the specific group that I'm working with of people like they all really truly love and are inspired by plant worlds and they want to share these interests and you know their acts of care with in conversation with many other people and knowledge systems and so um taking that out to like what's happening right now in in ecology which i can i can speak to a little bit in general i mean there's so many different fields in in you know the sciences and they all kind of have their little conversations but um, ecology is getting a lot of, you know, it got a lot of reckoning and pushback from, um, from the humanities for sure. And that trickles in. And then also from like sociology and political science, uh, political ecology, um, it, you know, and, and so now you've got young people coming in, scholars, you know, getting PhDs and they're, they're saying like, I want to think about what it, what it means to do decolonial research um, in ecological systems and what that looks like. And you go to conferences now and, uh, you know, there are panels and conversations um, 
and this has probably been happening for the past 10 years or so a little and then it's ramping up but um with with in, indigenous um scholars and you know um people who bring different modes of thinking about um, ecological systems, which often gets classified, again, like we like to name things as like traditional ecological knowledge, which is like, okay, I guess it's a useful term, but really it's like, okay, these, these incredibly important knowledge systems that have been in, in place for many thousands of years, you know, and um, ways of thinking about ecosystems that are so critical and important and um, have that, that ecological sciences have so much to learn about. So yeah, the de decolonial methodologies um, are, are really being grappled with right now um, and by young people coming in and then also older scholars who are responding, you know, responding to um, these necessary conversations and kind of starting to think about changing their work. Absolutely. So, but what does it really like, what does it mean to, to do that though, right? Like I, I think that's really complicated. I think it's one thing to theoretically grapple with these ideas, but like, you know, if you're gonna take it back to like anthropology and the way that they really had to reframe and recenter and rethink about how they do research, right? As anthropologists and enabling communities to tell their own stories as opposed to like overlaying the story, like how do you do that in plant worlds, right? Like how do you enable, allow the plant to tell its story as opposed to, you know, reducing, measuring, and then telling this, it's it's hard because everything's governed by funding sources and, you know, which are way behind on these kinds of conversations, like the real science money. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that looks like in a practical sense. Well, thank you so much for, you know, foregrounding uh, the sort of structural problems that are that were you know that are at the heart of this, but I also think you know in your response you've also touched on all the different levels of engagement, right? So there's individuals, there's um, uh, there's the actual structure of this knowledge and decolonial thinking and inflecting this kind of epistemology um, such that it's happening in the now, but so you know. 10 years from now, maybe we'll be in a different place where, again, these realms are not so separate and they're already integrated in, in an edge. I mean, that would be the dream, right? You know, where, where we start with this kind of synthetic thinking. Um, but, you know, I do think that there is this tension, right? Be in that manifests between art and science in at least the exhibitionary context, wherein there are just different expectations for a visual art exhibition versus a science exhibition. Absolutely. Often, you know, uh, when we go to an art museum, and I think that, you know, in popular culture, this has been parodied where it's like, oh, I don't get what this means, you know, with, with an artwork. Um, but there's almost a kind of um, affordance given to, to art where that's okay. You know, where it's like, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's okay to like, you know, it's an or it's expected almost that you won't um there won't be a kind of didactic uh implication to the exhibition um the work is the work and the artist doesn't have to explain it it's about this kind of experiential process we leave the explanation to the curators and the critics mm -hmm. but for science exhibitions um let's say you know you go to this kind of science museum hall of wonders type thing um perhaps because there is this, uh, you know, the, you know, scientists have a lot of academic training. Of course, artists also have a lot of rigorous training as well, but with science, there's almost this, um, because there's this idea that these theories are complex, it's not um, something that most of the population has had the time to do, or, you know, in, in the actual institutions, you know, we, we teach science, but, um, there's a lot of depth and, and complexity. Um, there's the uh, expectation in these exhibitions that these ideas will be translated for a lay person, right? It's, it's um, reduced, not reducing the complexity, but reducing the kind of information in, in, in a way that's digestible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so th there, there are these two different kinds of 
expectations for the actual experience. So how do you navigate that as an artist and scientist? And how do you think about the way visitors will experience your work? And maybe do you want them to experience it a certain way? Do you leave it open-ended? Mm -hmm. Big, yeah, really hard question and lots of so much learning on my end about this and like navigating these different cultural spaces, like you're saying, between the sciences and the arts. Um, it's totally different. And um, I think so. I also direct an art and science program at UC Santa Cruz that I started like five years ago. I run an art and science residency there um, and I'm I'm like facilitating and enabling collaborations between science faculty with um, artists and art students, usually MFA or um, sometimes undergraduates. And they're really fun and incredible. And it's like, it's thinking about these ideas and like what, you know, a lot of the questions you're, you're addressing. And so I've been troubling through them for years and trying to figure, and we've had a number of exhibitions and parts have been really successful and other parts, you know, I like why, I felt like they didn't work or some of the tensions you're pointing out, um, a tendency for science to be really descriptive and overly didactic is just the nature of the work. And um, I think, you know, science tends to want to find like the truth, right? Whatever like science is defining as the, the truth. I mean, that's like a whole rabbit hole of um, things you can unpack, but, um, and then whereas like artists are really looking at kind of creating meaning for things. Um, and so it's this meaning making that, that I think artists want to leave space for that allows also for individual experiences and more of an emotional connection to the work. Um, but then, you know, the, create space for someone to get inspired in their own ways. And, you know, there's, and so if you think about that from an educational context too, it's like, oh, that's so wonderful and expansive for the sciences to really learn from and think about as opposed to always like, you know, like explaining, 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 like how do you make more space for um, discovery? And that word, you know, it's funny to say that word in this context too, it just makes me like think of the problems associated with it, but yeah, and to have like, um, to have to make space for for people and students to really like come to their own and in these in these different um, experiences and I guess part of you know that it always comes back on like oh well there's so much that needs to be conveyed first like you need to learn to speak the language of science before you can then play with the creative tools of it um, because there's all this front loading that needs to happen which is why I think people tend to explain 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 um, so there's a tension there. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm a practicing ecologist, right. And so I'm doing real research and um, I specialize in, in multi-species entanglements or symbiotic species interactions and um, have worked a lot with Joshua tree systems. And so I do, you know, quantitative empirical research. And um, sometimes I want to share that with different audiences. I'm, I'm also doing a lot of advocacy work for, for plants to get endangered species protection. And so that means kind of communicating really like hard data um, and really hard and complex to understand uh, with audiences. And sometimes I do that through artwork. And so I think there's just, um, there's different spaces for it. And perhaps it's like knowing your space and your audience of like what's appropriate or how much to share and perhaps um, giving different entry points. Um, and so like for some of my work, which you know, um, cause you curated it was that I, I used augmented reality. So you could have like a phone, um, you know, that was another way I played with kind of like co-opting technological devices that people are so trapped in sometimes, but it's like, okay, you're gonna have it in your hand anyways. So point it at my painting um, and it's gonna animate it and tell a story about these processes that, um, you know, you can learn more if you want. Um, sometimes with some of the work, um, you know, there'll be, I'll have links to like dive deeper for research um, and to get more uh, descriptions, but I've really been, been fighting my science brain struggle to overly explain things. And it's a lesson I've been getting from the arts community is really like, like less is more, leave space, let people develop their own meaning making. And it's kind of, it's such a simple concept, but it was like, when I finally accepted, it was like a, like a light going off. And I was like, why was that so hard for me? Um, yeah, so it's, it's yeah, thanks for, for bringing up that question, but it's, it's something that now I'm sharing more with science scientists of like, if we're thinking about this art context, 
how can we like really leave some expansiveness for people to have their own experience without your overlay, you know, strong overlay um, right. in I mean, front, right? That can be I mean, a side. That, that's the project of entanglement, right? Is to, it's yeah, just to totally. recognize how it's, it's almost a kind of like humility about what we know, right? It's, yeah. there's only so much that can be explained using the methods that we already know about or, or that we're used to. And there are other ways in which knowledge is created and produced, meanings are made that we might not even you know, know yet because really? every intersection of you know, let's say disparate fields or not so disparate fields produces a new form of knowledge. And I think that's something that I really see um, in your work where it's, oh, you, you are interested in, you know, what does it mean to know and how can we know in, in different ways? And I think the way that you do that is um, through an ethics of care, as you've mentioned, um, mm -hmm. both as a scientist and as an artist and as an artist scientist. And <laughs> I think, um, you know, you've touched on this earlier in our conversation about the different kinds of care that you're you're seeing from the type of care that the people at uh, the botanical garden are doing, they're really passionate about it, to the kind of care that's involved and labor that's involved in embroidery. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I just think it's a perfect kind of intersection that like the word curator comes from the Latin mm, to care for, yeah. you know, to take care of. So there's already this overlap that, right. we're, that we're seeing, but um, maybe just as a concluding thought, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about care, um, both in this project and perhaps going forward in your practice. Mm. Yeah. Um... You know, I think of when you say that, I think about the materiality of, of care that I am using in some of my work and the way that I work with materials. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying and just kind of at the edges of really collaborative work with different um, organisms, you know, that are more and more being referred to as the more than human world in, in different um, contexts and conversation. But um, yeah, how I can really like better get at that and what that would look like um, to work collaboratively with different organisms, you know, that's not from such a um, anthropocentric um, space, which is hard. And it's, you know, it's just interesting philosophical journeys, right, to go on. Um, but then also like that also means like working with plant like I grow plants you know and and I think about I deeply think about soil ecologies and root systems and mycorrhizal entanglements and spaces and um you know what that all looks like these systems um and the acts of care involved in that and then that all that always like takes you the lens gets bigger and bigger right because then you're thinking about all of your actions and activities and how that impacts and um and then, you know, I, um, education is such a, a supreme act of care, right? Like working with people to um, develop new ways of, of caretaking and understanding and tending to our, our spaces together, I think is like one of the ultimate acts of care and community. Um, and so I guess moving forward, that's just kind of like, that's really on my mind is, um, how I can work better with the, the different um, the different beings that I'm called and inspired by um, to work with as an artist and a researcher, as a scientist, um, and you know what what that can look like to enable them to better share their stories and uh, inspire other people, um, but then also um, you know acts of care within my community, which I just see these all as like such intersectional conversations and really important like I can't think of being an ecologist without think of you know um, without thinking about all of the major issues of our time that we're dealing with and then you know the inequalities that um, that are such a constant struggle um, and um, all of all of these really critical issues so yeah moving forward that those those methods of acts of care are really much on my mind. Well 
Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. And I'm just so thankful for being able to be in conversation with you to continue our dialogue and continue working together. And for everyone watching, please, um, if you haven't had a chance, see the exhibition in person at the Julia Morgan Hall at the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tassif.